Okay, good evening and welcome back everyone to our Options Education webinar series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the Chief Strategist here at Options Play. And today we're here to talk about a topic that probably is not going to be at the top of your mind, which is hedging your portfolio against market correction, especially as markets make all time highs. However, the one thing that I wanna bring up is the fact that when we think about hedging, it's something that you should really think about as a preparation. You don't wanna be scrambling to understand how to hedge a portfolio or how to protect your portfolio when the markets are selling off. This actually, in my opinion, when the markets are reaching all time highs, when they're kind of in that euphoric stage, is the best time to actually start prepping and thinking about how to prepare yourself if and when the markets do correct and start to move significantly lower. Now, in the current environment where all central banks are easing and markets around the world are making all-time highs despite the challenges that we currently see, um, hedging your portfolio is probably not at the top of mind. So that's why I want to take the time today when you're not scrambling to try to figure out how to do this to review what are best practices, how do you actually go about hedging your portfolio, and what are your options to hedge your portfolio as well. Um, and discussing those things ahead of time, giving you ample time to learn and prepare for this and, and test it out and so that if and when the day comes that you are fully prepared and ready to potentially put on a hedge for your portfolio. So. Before we get started, what I'm gonna discuss here today is purely for demonstration purposes and is not a recommendation or solicitation to buy or sell any specific securities. And for those of you that are brand new to Options Play, welcome. What we're offering is a free online platform for you to analyze your options trades, access to bi-weekly options education webinars, just like the one you are on today, and a free on-demand options video library so that you can keep up with the education that we provide and access to different tools and reports to do your trading every single week. And all of that is available to you just by signing up at optionsplay.se, which I'm posting into the chat window right now. So the things that we're going to go over here today is we're going to start off by talking about the current market outlook and expectations that we currently see uh, before we, we discuss what is actually a portfolio hedge and who should use portfolio hedges. And with that, we'll also discuss what type of hedges can you put on because you can use options to hedge your portfolio. You can, there are also other ways that you can hedge your portfolio as well. So we're going to discuss those options before you decide for your own as to which one's best for you. And then what we'll dis discuss is what are the optimal portfolio hedges, meaning what are best practices if you are using a portfolio hedge. And more importantly, we want to show you how to analyze it using options play so that you can become self-sufficient in being able to look at these types of strategies on your own portfolio when you need. So with that, I'm going to first start off by uh, showing you guys just a brief uh, chart of where the current markets are. On the left-hand side, I have a weekly chart of the Stockholm 30 index. On the right-hand side, I have a daily chart of the Stockholm daily index. And I think as you can see pretty much, whoops, you can see pretty, pretty clearly that both on the weekly trend and on the daily trend, we have a very clear uptrend on both. And both uh, of these have recently just today made a new all-time high, both on the daily and the weekly candle. So this is telling me that markets are extremely strong, they're bullish. We have a started to creep up on what I would consider um, somewhat overbought conditions. If you look at the RSI reading on the weekly chart, it is just around that 70 level near overbought, same thing on the daily level. They're not quite overbought yet, so I don't think that a pullback is imminent. I do think that there could be some more room to the upside before that happens. Uh, and you know, if we look at this market, a lot of it is currently driven by the consumer market and global banks around the, uh, around the world are continuing to ease and making conditions easier for liquidity to be pumped into the system, which is reflected in the equity pricing that we're currently seeing I would say around the globe, not just in the Nordics. Um, we see this in the US, we see this in Canada, we see this in a lot of uh, developed and emerging markets right now where equity markets are making all time highs. And I think a lot of it is due to the, the central banks continuing to pump liquidity into the markets. So before I proceed, I just wanna ask the audience here in the room, how many of you are concerned about equity markets continuing to make all-time highs 
despite the fact that we're not really seeing a lot of growth, economic numbers isn't particularly strong around the world. Um, how many of you are concerned about a pullback in the markets? Um, please type yes into the chat window if you are. And if you're not and you think markets can continue moving higher for quite a bit of time, please type no into the chat window, just so I can get a sense for the audience here in the room. Okay, so, so far I see far more yeses than noes. I see a couple of noes, but most of you have responded saying, yes, you are concerned about a market pullback uh, sometime in the near future. And, and keep in mind that that's, that's part of why we're doing this, right? Is that even though that's not happening right now, and that may not happen imminently, may not even happen the next few months, but if and when that happens, how do you prepare your portfolio? That's what we're here to discuss. So, we're certainly nowhere near a recession right now, but I just want to talk through what are your options when the markets do enter a recession. And there are a few different options. You have what, what we consider a perfect hedge. Uh, we have reallocating to defensive assets, and then we have what's called a portfolio hedge. So let's first talk about the perfect hedge, right? Because who doesn't want to always have a perfect hedge? Whoops, let me... Uh, a perfect hedge. Um, a perfect hedge is simple. It just simply m means moving your assets, whether you are currently in equities, ETFs, mutual funds, fixed income, whatever it is that you're into, um, moving into cash, which is effectively puts your position at flat, and reinvesting once the correction is over or once the recession is over. That is what we call a perfect hedge. And the reason we call it a perfect hedge is because it hedges your entire portfolio dollar for dollar. And when there is a recession or if the market turns lower, you do not lose a single dime because your money is kept in cash and you're simply reinvesting after the correction. Now, this in a perfect world is what I think everyone should use. However, um, that's not always so easy. We don't always have the option of moving all of our assets to cash. You certainly couldn't move your house uh, you know, that you live in into cash. Uh, there are maybe investments that you have in, in certain um, asset classes that you want to hold on to for a certain period of time. For whatever reason, there are various reasons why we don't necessarily want to just simply move into cash. But you may move a portion of your portfolio into cash. So that's always an option to put your portfolio in when, you're, uh, when, when we're heading into a recession. The second most common uh, portfolio hedging strategy is to reallocate your, your um, assets into more defensive assets. And that typically means for most users, uh, fixed income is usually a first place to consider, right? As you grow older, as you uh, become more conservative in your risk taking, you shift your risk from riskier products and equities into fixed income, which are in theory less risky. Also high dividend paying stocks, stocks that give you a high amount of income that offsets some of the losses uh, is, is another way, another place that a lot of people will tend to diversify into or reallocate into. And lastly, you know, uh, um, assets that uh, are not correlated to the markets, such as gold or commodities. You know, we've seen over the last few months, a huge influx of flow into gold. And I think that that reflects the sentiment that many of you have about concerns about a recession or concern about a market pullback. People are buying gold because that is generally one of the ways that you can hedge your portfolio going into a recession. And we've seen that flow. And for those of you that follow or maybe even trade gold, uh, you've seen that inflow. And I think that reflects the market's concern about the markets. So that's your second option. Your third option is what we call a portfolio hedge. And that's what we're here to discuss today. And a portfolio hedge is simple. It's, it's buying a put option to protect your portfolio. And the reason that you want to buy a put option is because a put option will allow you to um, gain on your put option as the markets sell off that offset the losses that you have in your portfolio. So investor with a portfolio of stocks or ETFs, and so if you fall into this category and you believe that there's going to be a correction greater than 5% and you do not wish to sell any of your holdings, this is the type of investor that would consider utilizing a portfolio hedge. So you own a basket of stocks or ETFs, you think that there's going to be a correction greater than 5%, and you want to remain in some way, shape, or form invested in some of your assets. 
Maybe you rely on the dividends and you want to keep that asset. Maybe you think that that asset will hold up better than the markets, but you still think that there will be some losses as the market's correct. So this is really where we want to focus our attention on today, right? That doesn't mean that for those of you that want to do the perfect hedge or reallocate your, your, your assets to defensive assets, that you, know, you, you still should do that, but maybe a portion of your portfolio you want to stay invested and that's really where the portfolio hedge comes into play. So with that, let's take a look at what is actually a portfolio hedge. Now, a portfolio hedge is very simple. It's, a, it's basically think of it as an insurance policy on your portfolio. And what it does is it insures your portfolio during a market correction. And you start by buying a put option on a broad-based index. ETF or index option usually is suitable as a starting point. And the puts that you purchase will profit as the market corrects lower, which will offset any portfolio loss that you have. Now, it's really important to understand that this creates what we call an imperfect partial hedge, meaning this insurance policy, unlike an insurance policy on your car or your home that may cover 100% of your losses, a portfolio hedge when you buy a put is not going to offset your losses 100%. It's only going to generally offset a portion of your losses. So it's important for us to also understand how much are you, how much coverage are you actually going to receive? And that's the exercise that we want to go through here today is to show you when you buy a put option, how much can you actually expect that it's going to protect your portfolio? But the most important thing I think you need to remember is that despite sound, it sounding like this is a good idea, just like when you buy insurance on your, um, your home or your, on, or your house, uh, buying a protection or, or portfolio hedge on your portfolio is actually a really expensive um, proposition. So it requires active management, active management and timing. So what today we want to discuss is understanding just how expensive it is it to put on a portfolio hedge and how do you manage it actively and time a portfolio hedge to suit your needs based on where you think the markets are going to be. So with that, before I move on and start talking about best practices for portfolio hedging, um, I just wanna make sure everyone understands this you know, the concept of buying a put option on your portfolio. Um, so just by a raise of hands, how many of you have ever bought a put option on any stock or ETF before? Just type one if you have and type no if you've never bought a put option in before. Okay, so I see quite a few ones. I see a couple of no's. So for those of you that are brand new to trading put options, I do recommend that you take some time to learn a little bit more about trading calls and puts before you implement this type of strategy. You know, this webinar today is assuming that you have a basic understanding of buying put options. I will break it down for those of you that have never done it before. But again, if you're brand new to put uh, you know, buying a put, which is a simple option strategy. But if you're brand new to the strategy, I recommend that you take some time to learn more about the strategy before you do. So looking at a portfolio hedge from a visual perspective, this is your stock portfolio today. Meaning, I think it's pretty straightforward. Your stock portfolio, as the markets move higher, you're going to have unlimited profits to the upside. So as the markets keep moving higher and higher, you're gonna make more and more money. As the markets move lower, you're going to see more and more losses, right? So this is your current portfolio today. And I think everyone recognizes this chart or graphic. It's pretty simple to understand. As the markets move higher, you make money. As the markets move lower, you lose money. And what are we trying to prevent? We're trying to prevent the fact that you have unlimited losses if the markets were to move lower. So if you're expecting a recession to happen, if you're expecting the markets to correct lower, and you're concerned about the markets moving in this direction, what we're trying to help you prevent is further losses in your portfolio to the downside, okay? So that's what we're here, that's what this whole exercise is for, is to help us do that. So how can we do that? We wanna buy a put option. So what I have here is simply what a put option looks like, which also I think many of you are familiar. A put option will make money as the markets move lower, which is represented by this line here, and a put option will make more and more money to the downside as the markets keep moving move lower and lower all the way to zero. But the benefit of a put option is that no matter what happens, if we're wrong and the markets move higher instead of moving lower, the most you can lose on that put option is what you pay for that put. 
So even if you're wrong on the on the on the correction, let's say you think that there's a, there's a recession is going to happen and you think the markets are going to correct 20, 30% and it simply doesn't materialize and the markets just keep moving on higher, which I bet many of you have probably felt something similar to that over the last few years where you just felt that the markets are already at all time highs. Things are starting to slow down. I think a recession's coming and guess what? Markets keep moving higher, right? So you always have the opportunity of being wrong and a put option does protect you in that scenario where if you're wrong, the most you lose is what you pay for that put option. So when you merge your portfolio with this put option, what you get is a payoff that looks like this, which means that as the markets continue moving higher, right? Because the put option that you pay is limited in losses, you still have unlimited profits to the upside. So if you're wrong, you buy a put option and you're wrong and the markets keep moving higher, you can still have unlimited upside. The difference is that if you're right and the markets do sell off, what ends up happening is that the losses that you have in your portfolio will be somewhat offset by the puts or the profits that you have on your put option, which will mean that your 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 um, portfolio is protected from further losses to the downside. Instead, what you have is, is a chart that looks more like this. Um, so I would say in reality, um, that chart looks more like this because again, we don't have a perfect hedge, right? But what we're, do what we're preventing ourselves is losing down to in a straight line. What we want to do is we want to dampen some of those losses, depending on how much hedging you put you purchase it might look like this it might look like this but it still is a lot better than looking like this okay i just want to make sure everyone understands that before i move on please type three into the chat window if that makes sense to you in terms of what the risk profile actually looks like when you buy a put option on your portfolio perfect okay lots of threes great so Let's talk about the strategy itself. So now we know buying a put option is one way to, to protect ourselves. Let's actually talk about the strategy itself. So number one, what you want to do is you want to enter a hedge during a correction. And I know that sounds a little counterintuitive. Um, many, many times when you think about buying a put option on a stock that you, or ETF that you think is gonna move lower, you think about buying it before that move, right? Because if it moves ready, Puts will be a little bit more expensive. Um, you, you, might have, you might have lost out on some of the move. But from my perspective, because, and you can think back of you know, the last few years, right? Every single time the market runs higher, you think that it's gonna correct lower, but it only does it very slowly and then it will continue to move higher. And we've seen this over and over again. If you look at that chart before that I showed you of the Stockholm OMX 30, this is basically what we've seen over and over and over again. So if every single time you get to a peak and you buy a put option, guess what? You would have maybe made a small amount of money in a short period of time, but eventually you would have lost money as the markets kept moving higher. So from my perspective, it's better to actually wait until the markets have a serious correction to start um, getting into a put, uh, to get into a, a put option because you know this is really to try to protect you you from a recession all right and a recession simply just doesn't happen overnight you're not going to miss out on a recession if you if you're late by a week um so i always tell users that it's better to be late than early to buying a put option because I would say 80% of the time, if you tried to buy a put early, you would have ended up losing money on this particular trade. So I always advocate that if you're buying puts going into recession, wait till you're, you're pretty sure that things are really getting worse uh, before you consider stepping into buying that put option. It will be expensive, but you're, but you're buying protection when you actually need it and not anticipating when you don't need it. And on an exit strategy, when do you need to exit a, a hedging strategy? Is you want to hedge it, you want to exit once the correction is over. And I know that that sounds like, well, how do I know when a correction is over? Uh, a lot of times, what you can do is you can look at volatility charts. So you can look at volatility to get a sense for when a market is near bottom, because volatility is is an indicator that looks. Um, like this for the most part. And then what you get is you get these huge spikes to the upside when, when you get some kind of market sell-off and then they tend to normalize again and you get these huge spikes and they normalize again, okay? So these types of volatility peaks, those usually correspond with um, a market bottom. So you can use those typically as your, um, 
your indicator for when it might be time to take a hedge off. Now, so far we've talked about buying puts, right? But what do you buy puts on? And the, and the answer here for the Nordic markets, and this is, this is for those of you that are invested in Nordic equities, right? So if, you're, if your portfolio is predominantly in Nordic equities, uh, pretty much the one uh, broad-based index that you should consider using is the OMX 30 index. Um, if you have a US-based portfolio, then you might wanna use a US index like the S&P 500. If, you're, uh, if you have a bunch of German equities, then you might wanna use the DAX. Uh, whatever uh, your portfolio currently consists of, you want to try to find an index or ETF that closely correlates with your portfolio. So how many of you are invested predominantly in, in Swedish or Nordic equities? Please type Sweden or S into your chat window. And if you're, if you're invested in other markets, right? If you're, if you're, portfolio is predominantly in the US, you know, please type US. I just want to get a sense for, you know, where your, where are your portfolios? Okay, I see a lot of US, I'm sorry, I see a lot of Sweden. I see one person with US and Germany. Okay, so I, I think I've pretty much covered the full gamut here, right? So if you're, if you're in Swedish equities, you might wanna use an index like the Stockholm 30 index. If you're in the US, you might wanna use the S&P 500. In Germany, you might wanna use the DAX. Um, but one of the things that you might want to consider is that, for example, the Stockholm 30 index, there's the index option, and there's also an ETF on that index. The one thing I will say is that generally speaking, when you're buying hedging for, when you're buying puts for a hedge, you generally want to use the index option over the ETF option because they are cash settled at expiration. What that means is that when you buy a put option at the, let's say you buy a put option and uh, you know three months later the puts uh, are in the money and you've made money on that particular trade, you don't have to sell that put in order to realize the gains. At expiration, cash is deposited into your account. Whatever gains that you have on that put, simply cash is going to be deposited. There's no exercise, there's no, you don't have to deliver any shares, you don't have to take delivery of any shares, just cash is settled and it's easy, right? So if you've lost, let's say 100,000 uh, crowns in your portfolio and your put option is worth 50,000 crowns or you made 50,000 crowns in profits, then the 50,000 crowns are just simply deposited into your account in cash to offset that 100,000 crown, uh, 100, crown loss that you have in your overall portfolio. And it's just a really clean way to hedge your portfolio, okay? So how many, you, how many of you have ever traded the OMX 30 index options? Please type four if you have, or please type no if you've never traded the OMX index options. Okay, so a fair, almost half of you have said you have not traded the OMX 30 index option. So to, great. So I hope that you guys learned something new here today, especially with the cash settlement. Um, and that's what we're going to discuss here today. So now that we've talked about buying a put, we've talked about buying a put on OMX 30 index options. Let's talk a little bit about where do you buy puts? Do you buy puts in the money, out of the money, you know, long term, short term? So what I have here is a chart of time decay, meaning how the price of an option decays as you approach expiration. And I have three categories up here. I have out of the money, at the money, and in the money. And one thing you're gonna notice is that out of the money options decay at a faster rate than in the money options. And this is really because out of the money options are all extrinsic value versus in the money have a lot of intrinsic value and actually a relatively small amount of extrinsic value, which is the part that's going to uh, decay as you get approach expiration. Now this chart is not necessarily to scale, but it shows you where you get the fastest decay, which tends to be somewhere around here, right? So relatively short dated options, time to expiration, relatively short dated options that are out of the money is where you see the steepest decay or the fastest decay. And where do you get the least amount of decay? You get the least amount of decay up here, right? A relatively far out of the, uh, you know, far from expiration and in the money. So this is really where you have to think about. You're buying put options. What, where, what do you want that put option to do when you buy a put option? You want it to increase in value, right? So if you want it to increase in value, what do you want to avoid? You want to avoid, whoops, you want to avoid anything that looks like 
this, right? Because if you're buying an option and that option is decaying in value very, very fast, guess what? That's going to work against you. What do you want when you're buying an option? You want something that looks like this, something that's gonna decay very little because you don't want the value of your option to decay. So with that, whenever you're thinking about buying puts for your portfolio for hedging purposes, and to be, to be honest, this applies for any type of option that you purchase, uh, is that you generally wanna go a little further out in time. You generally want to prefer in the money options versus out of the money options because it limits the time decay of your option. And whenever you're selling an option, that's where you wanna focus on more shorter dated options that are out of the money that will give you the fastest amount of decay because when you're selling, you want that value of that option to approach zero as quickly as possible. So I just wanna make sure everyone understands this concept, the difference between uh, selling options and buying options here and why you wanna go further out in time in the money when you're buying and, and uh, closer to in time and out of the money when you're selling. So please type five into the chat window if that makes sense to you. Okay, perfect, great. So now that we've covered all of these things, I think what we can do is really talk a little bit about strike price, right? So we've talked about um, when you're buying, you wanna buy relatively in the money options, but I do wanna show you what the difference looks like. So when you're buying, just like when you're buying insurance, you have different levels of protection that you can buy, right? And I think the best way, and maybe some of you in Sweden don't have to deal with this because you have universal health care, but in the US, when we buy health insurance, we, we, we get to choose what type of coverage we want. And the better coverage, the, 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 the higher the pricing. And maybe, maybe you guys are familiar with buying private health insurance and you get to choose what level of protection you kind of want. So, you know, you can really think about buying what we consider catastrophic insurance, which is something that only uh, kicks in if there's some major issue, like if you have a, a major medical issue, then that covers it. Or you can buy more comprehensive coverage that covers, you know, just your everyday, you know, doctor's visit and things like that, right? So when you're buying insurance on your portfolio, you also have choices and it really just comes down to your strike price. So when you buy an out of the money put option, these 30 to 40 Delta put options, these are only useful for a major downside correction, meaning the markets have to drop significantly for this type of protection to start providing coverage on your portfolio. On the flip side, you can buy what we call comprehensive insurance. These are in the money put options, about 50 to 60 delta, and these will provide protection pretty much in any downside correction. So even if you get a correction of a small size, you still get some type of protection uh, on your portfolio. Now, Obviously, the more uh, comprehensive insurance you buy, the more expensive it's going to be. The cheaper one usually is one to 3% of your portfolio value. Now that's just over typically two to three months. So that's why when I say buying insurance is expensive, you know, uh, imagine if buying uh, your you know, insurance on your house cost you 1% of your house value every single month. You know, that's, that's not something you're going to buy, right? Same thing for, for, for here. And if it costs three to 5% of your house value for, to buy insurance for a couple of months, guess what? You're going to be underwater on your house pretty quickly. That's the same thing about buying protection on your portfolio. It's so expensive. It only makes sense to do it when, if, and when you actually expect the markets to correct. So I hope that this is clear to you just you know how expensive it is and i think the best way to really learn that is by looking at some examples um so before we look at real examples i just want to reiterate a couple of uh, uh, tips and best practices number one i can't stress enough hedging your portfolio is extremely expensive and constant hedging is not cost efficient because a lot of times you know if you just watch the first half of this webinar you're going to think to yourself why, well, why wouldn't I just always buy puts, right? Why wouldn't I just buy puts all the time so that if and when the market's correct, I get to protect myself? And the answer is because if you try to buy puts all the time, you're gonna be paying one, two, three percent of your portfolio every single month. You do that for 12 months and you've already lost 15, 20% of your portfolio. It's not worth doing that. It's gonna offset all the gains that you have in your portfolio. So it's better to be late than early, meaning wait until an actual correction happens, then enter your put option. 
And one of the ways that you can offset the cost of buying this put protection is to sell cover calls the rest of the year. Because if you sell cover calls, you can offset some of the cost of buying those puts. So when things are good, like they are right now, sell cover calls, generate premium, use that premium at the end of the year whenever you need to, to buy puts to offset the cost of buying those puts. And again, in the money puts, in my opinion, will provide better overall protection versus out of the money puts will only provide you with what we consider catastrophic protection. So does that make sense to everyone? Before we jump over to some strategies, just type six into your chat window if all of that makes sense to you. Okay, perfect. So Let's take a look at this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how you can use options play, which all of you should have access to this by now. Um, how to utilize this tool to look at a buying a, a protection on your portfolio. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the OMX, oh, sorry, this is the, this is the ETF, right? And you can buy puts using the ETF as well, which, which follows the OMX uh, 30, Stockholm 30 index. You're perfectly okay utilizing this ETF. But the only problem with the ETF is that if you buy a put and the put expires in the money, then you have to deliver the shares um, or you have, then you have to sell your shares. Um, so that's not something you necessarily want. You just, or you have to sell your put. That's why in my opinion, the OMX 30 um, index option, it is a substantially larger value option. So that is something that you have to consider as to whether or not uh, it makes sense for you to buy something of such a large size because a single contract is 184,000 crowns in terms of effective uh, yield. So it's something to consider as to whether or not your portfolio size can trade in 184,000 crown increments or if it's better for you to trade in 230 crown increments, which is the ETF. But that's one of the things that you want to consider. But what we were going to do is I'm going to show you how to utilize this tool to set up looking at a hedge. So what we're going to use is we're going to use this particular um, uh, option as our portfolio. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a couple of put options. So I'm gonna use our strategy constructor by clicking on modify. I'm gonna use our strategy constructor to pull up bear strategies. So I'm gonna use a long put. And let's say I go out to uh, March, 2020, and I'm looking at a both in, in the money put, and then I'm going to look at an out of the money put. So I'm gonna look at March, and let's say I use an eight, so the index is at eight, uh, 1855 right now. So let's say I use an 1860 and an 1830. Um, do I have, uh, let's do 1870 and an 1830, right? So 100, and before you do this exercise, one of the things I highly recommend is to use our risk and investment calculator, which allows you to enter your actual portfolio value. So let's say you have, uh, a, a portfolio value of a million crowns, right? So roughly a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. What this now notice how this will, you know, change this equity portfolio to about a million crowns. And what it'll show you is that you need to buy five puts to hedge a million crown portfolio. Now, if you have a 5 million crown portfolio, you can put that in and it'll automatically calculate the number of puts that you need to purchase. But we're just gonna use a million crowns for round numbers for this particular exercise. But please put in the actual account value you have because then you will actually be able to calculate the real cost to put on a hedge. So for this million crown portfolio, this cost me 26,000 crowns and this cost me 17,000 crowns, right? So. This is 2.6% of my portfolio to buy this comprehensive insurance, the in the money put, and to buy the catastrophic insurance cost me 1.7% of my underlying portfolio value to buy a month and a half of protection. This is going out to March 2020, right? So let's take a look at these portfolios. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what happens if the market stays exactly where it is? Meaning a month and a half later, the market maybe moves a little higher, but pulls back or pulls back, but then comes back to the current level around 1850 uh, or so. If that happens, as you can see on my, uh, on my actual portfolio, I would have no losses because obviously my stock portfolio would not lose money if the stock stays, if the market stays exactly where it is. But as you can see here, 
many times people shy away from buying expensive insurance because they're concerned, well, if I don't need it, then I'm going to lose out on that money. But one of the things that what we said before is that when you buy in the money options, they decay at a lower rate. And as you can see here, even though this costs 26,000 crowns versus 17,000 crowns, the loss on my hedge is going to be actually less than the out of the money options because the out of the money options will erode to zero if the markets don't move any lower. Here, my in the money options do not erode to zero because the, some of it is intrinsic value, the rest of it is extrinsic value. So as you can see, even though this comprehensive insurance costs more, I actually lose less money if the markets don't move and the, and the hedge that I put on is ineffective, right? So that's the first step where I want to start is to show you that even if the markets don't move, the in the money options that are more expensive, the comprehensive insurance provides you with what I would consider a better outcome, right? Because instead of losing 17,000 crowns, you only lose roughly 1,500 crowns, 15,000 crowns. Not a huge difference, but still there's a benefit to that in the money option. So I wanna make sure everyone sees that first before I move on. So please type seven into the chat window if that part makes sense to you, that if the markets don't move, the more expensive put option actually provide less, uh, a smaller losses than buying that cheaper out of the money option that will simply erode to zero if the markets don't move any lower. Okay, perfect. So now let's take a look at what happens if the markets do move lower. Let's say the markets um, move to, let's say, you know, I'm just looking at this chart here, right? Uh, the markets broke out above the 1760 level here in mid December. I think that is a possible, you know, pullback level that I would be looking at around 1760. Um, so if the markets pull back to 1760, here I've lost 47,000 crowns on my actual stock portfolio, right? So the market pulls back roughly 5%. I'm going to lose about 5% on my portfolio. Now let's look at the comprehensive insurance. How much of that do I get back? Out of the 47,000 crowns that I get back, uh, that I lose, I get 28,000 back. So roughly net net, I'm only down about 20,000 crowns as opposed to 47,000 crowns because I'm making 28,000 of that back. So this comprehensive insurance that cost me a little bit more is going to give me a fair amount of coverage. So instead of losing 47,000, I only lose 20,000. Does that make sense to everyone? Please type eight into the chat window if that makes sense to you, if that math makes sense. Okay, now let's take a look at the catastrophic insurance. So yes, this cost me significantly cheaper amounts of money, but notice how here, what it does is it, because it doesn't kick in until the markets move significantly lower, if the markets move 5% lower, it's only giving me 18,000 uh, crown profit as opposed to the 28,000 crown profit with the more expensive options. So yes, I do get some protection. If the market moves 5% lower, I lose 5% on my portfolio. I gain 1.8% back. So I'm still down about 30,000 crowns in this particular case, right? So here in the comprehensive insurance, I lose 20,000 crowns. In the cheaper insurance, I lose 30,000 crowns. But as you can see, if the markets still continue to move significantly lower, let's say it moves down to 1,700 crowns. Now I'm looking at about an 80,000 crown loss on my portfolio, but I make 58,000 back. So net, I'm still down just roughly about 20,000 crowns. And that's the type of, of um, hedge that I will receive with this comprehensive insurance. No matter how far those markets go, I'm going to lose roughly about 20,000 crowns, even if the market goes to zero. Um, which unlikely to happen by March, but if it did, instead of losing a million crowns, I would only lose roughly 20,000, 25,000 crowns. In the ca catastrophic insurance here, I've lost 80,000 crowns and I've made 48 of that back, which means that net I'm losing about 30,000 crowns or so. And same thing, if the markets go to zero, uh, this will protect me to the downside almost dollar for dollar, uh, I'm sorry, crown for crown as it goes below you know, this 1830 level, and the more money it goes, the, the further I'm going to gain. But the difference between these two will always be roughly about a thousand, 10,000 crowns, which is the difference in the cost of these two options. So this gives you an understanding of how you can utilize options play to look at 
different levels of protection. You can play around with it with different strike prices. You can choose further in the money, closer to the money. You can compare strikes that are a little closer to each other or maybe strikes that are a little further away from each other. And you can really play around with the different levels of protection that you can buy and then use the P&L simulator like this to get a sense for, well, if the market has moved just a little bit lower, which one do I prefer? If the market moved much lower, which one do I prefer? And then asking yourself, where, well, how far do I think this market can move lower? And this tool allows you to simulate those uh, scenarios and quickly get a sense for which one is suitable for you. And once you're ready to execute a trade, all you have to do is hit the trade button and you have all the details on how to enter that into your brokerage platform. And this is all designed from the ground up to allow you to quickly look at any symbol, uh, put together scenarios side by side and being able to compare different strategies. And that's something that most platforms will not provide you with is the ability to, to put these scenarios side by side and use our PL simulator to see where does the market, um, if the market goes in a certain direction, what are, what are my expectations so that you are informed before you make your decision and execute an actual trade. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out here this evening to uh, listen to us to talk about you know how to hedge your portfolio showing you how to utilize our platform so that you can use this and become self-sufficient in using this platform on your own um, so with that what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up for questions and answers if you have any questions please type them into the chat window uh, and I will try to answer as many questions as I have time for and just a quick announcement um, for those of you that are you know using our technology platform and our education. Uh, you can sign up using optionsplay.se, but I wanted to let everyone know that um, we're gonna be launching a new educational format in two weeks uh, where we're gonna do more course style, where we're gonna, we're gonna have uh, multiple courses where you're gonna learn more in a cohesive manner. And we're gonna do a full webinar on just looking at different uh, symbols, looking at uh, answering your questions. Uh, so we're going to change up the format a little to make the education a little better for you starting in two weeks. So with that, what I'll do is I'll, answer, I'll open this up for Q&A. So again, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat window. Um, looks like Jens had a question here. Um, but you can buy more out of the money contracts for the same money. You can save 9000 buying out of the money you have to take into account also. But Jens, you're absolutely right. You can buy more, but even if you bought more, right? So even if you bought more in this particular case, like you said, I can buy uh, 10 contracts instead of five. So let's say I buy 10, uh, 12 contracts, right? same dollar amount. But that still doesn't stop you from is losing money if the markets don't move, right? So if the markets don't move or it moves a little bit lower, guess what? You're not getting any protection from this. So yes, you're risking the same amount of money for the still, still the same probability of losing money on that particular trade. So I don't advocate that you just because the out of the money puts are cheaper that you buy more because you still need the markets to move a significant amount before those kick in. And unless you're absolutely sure that the markets are going to move significantly lower, um, and I don't believe that anyone necessarily can, can have that, um, that thought process, but you know, that is the only time where it makes sense to buy more of the out of the money puts. If you're so confident that the market's gonna move lower, you certainly can. But again, if the markets don't move lower like you expect it to, you're going to lose all of it. At the very least that if you buy less of it, right? If you only buy the five contracts and the markets don't move, um, you know, instead of losing, uh, instead of losing 30,000 crowns, now you only lose 13,000 crowns. So that would be my suggestion to you, Jens. Um, Jens is also asking, where is it we can see previous episodes? Great question. So um, we actually just launched the new options education page, and I want to show that to you here. Um, so that uh, the question was, where can we um, access the new uh, the previous videos and we just launched the new options education video page so you can I just posted the link to you guys here under the education we have section we have a section for webinar recordings um, it's optionsplay.lpages.co and you can see all of our previously recorded webinars and we're going to post this one to that page as well very soon so you can view all of our previous recordings using the link I just sent to everyone in that chat window um,
Bo is asking, can you only update strategy description and risks? Just don't want to update the entire page. Um, I see what you mean, Bo. That's something we'll take a look into and in seeing if we can update the pricing on that. Um, a great question. That's not something we currently do, but it's a good feedback and I will um, take that back to our team. Uh, is the Options Play platform active for users to test? Yeah, so this is available to everyone free of charge in the Nordics. You just have to sign up at optionsplay.se. So I highly recommend you to take a look and trade that. Um, sounds great. Thank you for good webinars. I bought two at 1810, two at 1800, and two at 1750 today. Far out, but I felt it was fairly cheap today. So, uh, you know, again, I think that's more of a speculative view on the markets. You know, if you uh, believe that things are going to turn around, but from my perspective, markets reaching all time highs is not the best time to buy put options um, because you see the strength, and the strength is not just. You know, the strength is on what I think are, 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 are good reasons for the markets to have strength. I mean, you have central banks easing around the world. Um, you know, earnings numbers coming out are fairly strong, driven by um, consumers. You know, h &M, the H&M uh, earnings announcement a few days ago was not particularly great, uh, which is concerning. But, you know, I, I think that the central bank easing is really what's driving a lot of this um, upside movement in equity markets. And I think it's really hard to fight central banks um, un until they break, right? And I don't see that happening in, in the very short term. So that's my, again, why I don't think it makes sense to buy puts right now. I think it's better to wait until things start to turn around before you buy puts. They will be more expensive, but cheap doesn't mean you should buy it. Cheap doesn't mean it's a good investment. There's, sometimes there's a reason that it's cheap. Um, so keep that in mind. Bo is asking, when you sell premium, you have to see IV rank above 50. Is IV rank on options play? So Bo, um, IV rank is not something we currently have on our platform. It's something we're working on. However, this concept of selling when IV rank is above 50, I think is, in my opinion, a bit of an overgeneralization of volatility because IV rank only looks at volatility of a single expiration. And it really depends on the expiration that you are selling. So Keep that in mind, Bo, before you just go out and do uh, that generalization that when IV rank is above 50, you sell. If it's below, you buy. Learn a little bit more about volatility. Learn about how IV rank is actually calculated um, because it is just a generalization. It is not specific to the option that you are actually selling yourself. So sometimes you might actually sell options that aren't that expensive, um, even though IV rank is above 50. So keep that in mind, Bo. Any other questions? Uh, you can, if you have a question, if you have an issue with your platform, the best thing to do is on the upper right hand corner, there's a thing called questions ask us. Um, you can type in your question. You can even include a screenshot of your screen so that we can see um, what your screen looks like. It'll help us um, work through any problems that you have. Bo, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Any other questions? Um, if there are no other questions, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time out here this afternoon. Like I said, what we'll do is we'll post this recording along with the slides and we'll email it to everyone afterwards in a few hours. Um, and just take the time to, to, to learn more about this, especially if you're new, because it's something that you're going to need one day in your toolbox. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, maybe not the next year, but it's a good skill set to, good skill set to have if and when the markets turn lower and knowing exactly where you want to start. So when things hit the fan, you're prepared and you're ready to execute that put uh, very quickly. So with that, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you guys have a great evening and I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys in two weeks with our new options education format in two weeks. We're going to talk about beginner strategies um, or beginner topics for options. And I think for those of you, even experienced traders could really utilize a refresher on some of the basics because Everything that we do on, from a more advanced strategy perspective is really based on the fundamentals and the basics. So I hope to see you guys there in two weeks. So have a great evening and I'll see you guys next time.